Um, again, I'm going to talk about uh, our manure-related CIGs that we've funded over the years. But uh, since everybody's eating, and, and uh, uh, to give everybody a chance to maybe finish up a little bit and, and uh, maybe to, to provide some fun, I thought I'd spend about five minutes uh, just doing BS, just doing, just doing bull, just talking about, uh, just talking about manure and, and some of the history of manure that, that uh, we don't often uh, think about. It's probably information that you'll never, ever need. Maybe it's information you'll provide uh, somebody a, a, a laugh at a at a cocktail party sometime, uh, and it's not CIG related, but uh, it might be worth taking uh, taking a listen of. We all think that uh, we're all here. We're interested in, in uh, new and innovative technologies for for handling uh, handling animal manure, but we're not the uh, by by far we're not the first ones. About uh, uh oh, Joe, help. Oh, wrong. Yeah. About 4,000 years ago, there's, uh, there's actually records, hier hieroglyphics, that show that the ancient Egyptians actually hatched eggs in compost piles. They'd actually, actually build the compost pile, build the heat up, put the eggs around the outside, and then because eggs have to be turned several times a day, they'd tear the piles down or tear down part of the pile to turn the eggs and then build it back up again. But 4,000 years ago, these guys were using compost to hatch eggs. I'm not talking about uh, just hatching a couple eggs or a few eggs. They were hatching, hatching eggs, uh, hatching more than 10,000 birds at a time in, in manure piles, and that's pretty amazing. To, about 100 years ago, our American poultry industry finally beat hatchability figures, uh, the number of birds that hatch per, per number of eggs set, that the Egyptians were doing 4,000 years ago in manure piles. So, so that's pretty, that's kind of, kind of astounding that that, that, that happened. <clears throat> you all may not know that the Greeks and Romans believed that, uh, that manure from a rooster, actually a fighting cock, because fighting cocks were so, were so uh, fierce, uh, the manure from a rooster spread over the body could protect you from attack by lions and panthers. Well, I gotta tell you, I've tried this. And, and I got to tell you that not only does it work with lions and panthers, because I've never been attacked by either one, but my wife won't have anything to do with me either. Maybe she just won't have anything to do with me. Maybe that's the way it is. Pliny the Elder in the first century AD wrote of the belief that hen's manure massaged into the scalp would cure baldness. Now, now, it works pretty good in the front of the head, but I know that in the back of the head, I've got a big bald spot back there where it hasn't worked nearly as well. A little closer to our time and a little closer to, to uh, maybe what we're uh, people that we're actually familiar with, in the 17, uh, 1780s, John, John Adams actually wrote down his, his recipe for compost. Uh, seaweed, marsh mud, dead ashes, dung, uh, livestock waste, weeds, kitchen scraps, in the course of a year would make a great quantity of choice manure. And, and, and those that know Adams know that, uh, that Adams thought of himself as much of, uh, as a farmer as he did a statesman or a lawyer. Um, in 1793, jo Thomas Jefferson wrote to his daughter, we will try this winter to cover our garden with a heavy coating of manure. When earth is rich, it bids defiance to droughts, yields in abundance, and of the best quality. Even old George Washington, uh, in June 1785, Washington asked a friend in England to help him find a farm manager who, above all, Midas-like, could convert everything he touches into manure as the first transmutation towards gold. A couple years later, Washington actually gave detailed directions for building his manure repository, or what was essentially his composter. He said, when you go to the repository for compost, if the bottom should not be of good clay, put clay, in, clay there and ram it well before you pave it. He directed that the manure pit have masonry sides and the bottom be paved with cobblestones and that uh, it be made out of posts set into a foundation uh, or directly into the ground. And if we, look at, uh, if we look at Washington's composting facility, his repository, on the left, it's very similar to a small-scale NRCS-approved uh, composter on the right. Even notice the, uh, the cross-bracing on the, on the uprights. And uh, so, so it, uh, Washington was leave a little ahead of his time and a little ahead of our time, I guess. Maybe, NRC, uh, maybe NRCS could, uh, could hire him if he, needed a, if he needs a good job. 
in the uh, early part of, uh, or the mid part of, of, uh, of the uh, 19th century, gathering buffalo chips on the Great Plains was a, was a big pastime because there was no wood to burn, uh, burn for food or, or, for, uh, or for heat. So people gathered buff buffalo chips by the wheelbarrow load uh, to do that. Actually, any place in the world where there's not a great deal of, of wood to burn for cooking and for heat, um, uh, people have, have turned to animal manure to, uh, to provide that, uh, that bio, biomass that's needed for, for energy production. Even in the Old Testament, uh, uh, I think it's in uh, Ezekiel, um, uh, God tells Ezekiel that his people shouldn't use, uh, shouldn't bake their bread on fires from the dung of man, but uh, should use the dung of, uh, of cattle instead. Well, en enough gathering buffalo chips. Um, let, let's go to a conservation innovation grants. Um, NRCS got, uh, got conservation innovation grants. It's been a great tool for us uh, because of the 2002 Farm Bill. Congress, when they wrote the 2002 Farm Bill, they put conservation innovation grants and allowed NRCS to use up to 10 percent of the Environmental Quality Incentives Program uh, for conservation innovation grants. Um, EQIP is, is essentially a billion dollars a year. So the authorization would have allowed us to actually use up to $100 million a year uh, for CIG. So it's a tremendous amount of money that was authorized. NRCS has never spent that m amount of money, but we do spend a substantial amount, and we'll talk about that more in, in the future. Joe mentioned a minute ago that we can't do, that, uh, we can't do research. Um, our charter from Congress, the way NRCS was created from Congress, Congress said that, that you guys can't do research, that the arm of agriculture that does research is ARS. So NRCS can't do research, but we can do de demonstration and technology transfer. So many times, government programs that put out an RFP, it's for research. And there's an awful lot of university people here in the room, and university people tend to think of, think of, uh, of research and maybe less think of, of demonstration and technology transfer. And, and that's what, uh, what the CIG, CIG program is all about. Since 2004, which was the first year of CIG, uh, NRCS has funded almost 500, pro uh, uh, almost 500 CIGs. It's, a, it's been a big effort, um, and uh, an awful lot of projects have been funded uh, all over the country. $181.7 million has gone into, into uh, CIG, almost $182 million. That's a lot of money that's gone into this program and been spread pretty much over the uh, over all of agriculture and pretty much all over the uh, all over the country. Of the uh, of the uh, 500 grants that have been funded, 122 of those are strongly animal related. I say strongly animal related because some of them that are cropping cropping type CIGs that are for um, for uh, feedstuffs that would be used by cattle uh, or by animals, I really don't consider them to be uh, to be strongly animal related. Uh, and uh, the strongly animal related ones, there's about 122. 24.7% of the grants have been animal related, uh, $47 million, uh, and 26% of funds have, have actually gone to animal related grants. Of the 500 grants that have been funded, 96 are manure related. Almost 20 percent, almost 40 million dollars, and 22 uh, percent of the funds have have gone to manure-related grants. So we put a lot of money into grants, and we put a lot of money and, and a lot of effort into uh, into manure-related grants uh, as uh, uh, as they are. This table, I do, this whole thing, this whole talk, all these all these uh, all these slides are going to be up on the web, and I put this table in. You can't see it, you can't read it. But it gives the same information I just gave uh, by year of the CIG program. If anybody wants that information, they'll be able to download it if they download the slides uh, in, the near, in the near future. The manure-related CIGs, um, actually all of the CIGs, rather than just manure-related ones, we've seen varying degrees of success. For the most part, they've been successful. Uh, even those projects that aren't fully successful, in some ways, they have been, although there might be problems, uh, problems that do exist. A lot of the problems result from lack of planning. 
A lot of people, a lot of people submit the grants, and and we review the grants and and fund the grants. And maybe the people really don't know what they're doing when they submit the submit the grant proposal in the first place. So a lot of times it's lack of planning. A lot of times it's lack of funding. Uh, CIG will fund up to a million dollars, but you've got to have a million dollars in in match. And sometimes, sometimes you think you've got that million dollars in matching funds lined up, and it might not come to fruition. And uh, then you've got to either adjust or, or do away with uh, do away with the project. Sometimes, again, it's a lack of understanding of the grant. Uh, we get an awful lot of lot of uh, a lot of proposals, and have had a lot of proposals over the years that are basically research proposals trying to be snuck through. And uh, a lot of times when we review the proposals, uh, we see that they're actually research and, uh, and, uh, and then don't fund them because of that. But uh, once in a while, a research grant will sneak through. And we might not get, NRCS might not get any benefit out of the grant, but somebody else might. So even though it's not successful from, a, from an NRCS standpoint, it might be a very successful research project that's, uh, that's snuck through. Well, the manure-related CIGs have, have, have been all over the board. Uh, they've dealt with uh, all sorts of technologies, uh, anaerobic digesters, community digesters, environmental credit trading, uh, lagoon management, manure, manure to energy generation, uh, alternative litter sources, storage, handling, pathogens, odor, uh, emissions mitigation, and that's just a few. There's uh, been, I think, all, all over the board we've had, uh, we've had, uh, uh, we've funded Manure-related CIGs, and and uh, we've we've only funded uh, a portion of those that have been submitted. The next slides are are, are actually I'm going to talk about individual CIGs, some of those that uh, have been successful or or mostly successful. And I just wanted to to show you the the uh, how the slides are set up. So uh, we've got the entity that got the uh, got the grant, uh, the title, and the outcome. And the outcome will, will probably be the positive outcome, and, and if there's any problems or any, any questions about the grant or the technology, uh, things that, uh, that NRCS uh, is interested in. In 2004, we funded Alabama Mountains, Rivers, and Valleys um, uh, we, to do an on-farm demonstration of low-cost alternatives for temporary litter facilities. Um, this project looked at steel truss buildings uh, for temporary litter facilities. Um, they showed uh, one of the things that they showed from this grant was that it was an, there was an attractive cost benefit ratio and good farmer acceptance. Um, probably the thing that NRCS questioned at the end of the grant was the long term performance because most of our grants are three year. What happens in year four, five, six, and seven with this uh, with these steel trucks? Uh, Steel, steel trust buildings, and uh, even though it was a good good project, we still have some questions, uh, or still had some questions at the end of end of this thing. University of Georgia looked at uh, using cropping alternatives to improve water quality in high nutrient status farms. Uh, they looked at a localized crop, pearl millet, that can be raised in the southeast, uh, and uh, that could actually be utilized uh, to uh, improve water quality. Pearl millet is acceptable to poultry and, and I believe swine. I'm not sure about cattle. And uh, it can be grown in the southeast. And, and there's been a lot of interest in using pearl millet because you're not moving the corn from the Midwest to the southeast to feed to, feed to poultry and then being left with the, uh, the nutrients and the manure to deal with. You're dealing with a localized, uh, localized uh, grain uh, that has not been a, an accepted grain in the past. To, uh, by the poultry industry. 2005, Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection um, did, a, did a project t titled Wisconsin's Dairy and Livestock Air Emissions Odor Project. They evaluated various BMPs for mitigating odors, uh, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide from dairy operations. And it was successful. They were able to verify the, the, uh, uh, the use of the BMPs and the changes that they would make. And they provided NRCS with a basis for re making recommendations uh, on those practices. So it was a good project. Iowa Cattlemen's Association did a project on vegetative treatment systems. Uh, and uh, they looked at uh, vegetative treatment areas under varying situations, resulted in a number of tech notes on siting, design, and management of VTAs, and a collaborative report uh, on VT vegetative treatment system 
uh, for open uh, feedlot runoff. All those things can be found at, uh, at this link, uh, and if you download the slides later, later in, the, in the week, uh, you ought to be able to get to that, uh, to that uh, link. Virginia Tech did a good, really good project in 2005, precision feeding to reduce nutrient losses from Virginia dairy farms. Uh, there was a significant educational programming effort uh, that was completed as part of the project. Uh, they worked directly with over, over 200 farmers. They developed an incentive system for actually paying farmers to adopt practices so that farmers wouldn't lose. That's one of the problems when, when you get farmers ask farmers to adopt a practice is they're afraid that, that uh, something's going to go wrong and they're going to affect their production negatively. Well, these guys uh, developed an incentive system uh, and uh, paid farmers to adopt uh, new technology. A uh, total of three national webcasts, eight conference presentations, four peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, five newsletters, and two abstracts uh, were presented to farmers and, and advisors. So it was a good project and, and uh, the type of project that we like to see. Washington State University in 2005 did a project development and integration of a national feed management educational program and assessment tools into a CNMP. This was run by Joe Harrison. Joe Harrison was the primary prime author on this. I think about half the people in the room were probably part of that project because it uh, was it six states or nine states uh, were involved in the, in the project. Uh, put together a tremendous number of educational tools on feed management. Feed management fact sheets, uh, training training tools for TSPs for feed management, uh, part of a CNMP, creation of a feed management uh, or a feed nutrient management tool. Um, the fact sheets and all the tools are available either on the Washington State University Dairy Nutrient Management page, or on I put LPES. I guess it's LPELC uh, web page, but it's available. You should take a look at that and look at the information that's available on feed management because the team that, uh, the team that worked on this effort uh, just did a tremendous job of putting together materials. There must be, must be 30 fact sheets, I would think, anyhow there that, uh, that uh, can all be utilized by, by people dealing with farmers. Penn State University did a good, good, did a good uh, project on controlling odor and nutrient losses to surface runoff, groundwater, and air uh, with new technologies. The new technology was manure injection on no-till and sod soils. Um, the project really gave NRCS a scientific basis to recommend manure application practices for reducing nutrient management, or reducing nutrient losses to water and air in the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, we're, the manure injection technologies being used were relatively new, and, uh, and uh, in getting them adopted widely in the mid-Atlantic area, the Chesapeake area, uh, this was an important project. A company called Coltec in West Virginia did a, did a project on gasification of poultry litter to produce bioenergy. Uh, it was a successful project. Um, but one thing that, uh, even though even though these projects are supposed to be ready to ready for prime time when they come to NRCS, we, we all do a project and, and we learn things. We learn things that can make the project operate better. And one of the things that Coltec learned was that they needed to to discover ways to properly manage uh, and prepare the gasifier fuel. The gasifier fuel being uh, being poultry litter. That uh, they needed to be able to manage the moisture content of the litter. And, or maybe even change the form that the litter is in to make it uh, more burnable. Cuyahoga County in, uh, in, uh, in New York uh, looked at a regional digester. The project demonstrated the value of mesophilic digester technology uh, to community digesters that co-digest other products along with dairy waste. Um, it showed the value of large-scale digesters and large-scale digestion. Uh, there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us. I think uh, uh, with uh, with NRCS and, and a lot of us uh, in, in the industry that believe that uh, that larger digesters are, are much more able or capable or or may have a better chance of of actually being successful. And if you can go with a community digester where you've got several farms all dumping into the same digester, or a uh, or a municipality even putting uh, putting maybe food waste into the digester, uh, then maybe the uh, digester has a much better chance of success. <clears throat> Environmental Credit Group uh, in 2007 did a 
did a project providing carbon credit incentives for the adoption of lagoon covers on hog farms in North Carolina and dairies in, uh, in New York. The project found that the possibility of covering lagoons to flare methane is entirely possible, but that current in 2007 market prices and condition for greenhouse gas credits was not found to be sufficient to stimulate farmers to adopt this technology. Well, that was in 2007. We've got another CIG that was funded last year or the year before dealing with carbon credits uh, with the beef and dairy in the western part of the United States. And I talked to the project principals on that project a couple days ago, and they indicated to me that the, the carbon market is growing so fast in, in California that they feel that within five years the California carbon market will have surpassed that of Europe, which we've always used as a, as a yardstick, as a benchmark to, to try to attain. Well, here we've got the, just the state of California maybe doing that much trading. And what happens in California generally translates to the rest of the country. Brinson Farms in Mississippi, there was a good poster last night, maybe it's still up over there, uh, on methane capture on broader, broader uh, poultry farm for renewable energy and environmental protection. Um, this was a uh, project burn, uh, 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 anaerobic digestion of, of broiler litter, um, and uh, it was successful enough, enough that we, start, we that it's actually being transferred. There are several other of of the same. Um, <laughs> ah. do I take do I take the call? No, it's my, it's my wife talking about that, spreading the poultry manure. There we go. <laughs> Maybe that was my cue to stop. Uh, <laughs> any, anyhow, this is, this is a successful project, but NRCS still has, still has questions because it, it doesn't make sense to, to many of us to bring the manure from 30% moisture up to 90% moisture to, to put it through an anaerobic digester and then have to deal with liquid waste in the end of it and try to try to figure out how to handle all that water. So, so I think that uh, even though this was a successful project and we see the, the uh, technology being transferred, there are still some questions that, that probably need to be answered. In 2010, Washington State University, again, Joe Harrison's group, uh, looked at decision, a decision aid tool to enhance adoption of the feed management uh, practice standard um, and uh, looked at the uh, a tool that actually looked at the economics of, uh, of the feed nutrient, uh, nutrient management plan. Um, uh, WSU uh, uh, put together the tool, uh, put together fact sheets. Uh, again, those are available on the Washington State uh, University webpage or on the LPELC webpage. The rest of these are, are just, uh, just the name of the, of the institution that, uh, that got the grant and the name of the grant. And I'm, I'm not going to spend any time uh, on these um, and because you can, you can look at these if you download the slides. But uh, some of them are, 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 are pretty interesting and, and uh, uh, gives you an idea of, of the breadth of the types of, of, uh, of projects that we actually uh, are funding. This first one, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, got a grant to, to use gypsum curtains uh, to reduce uh, phosphorus, uh, phosphorus runoff from poultry operations. Here between the, on the fields, uh, uh, between the, where the poultry litter is spread and the stream or the ditch that's beside the poultry farm, they, they dig a trench and put in gypsum and then that ties up the phosphorus as it moves through and, and keeps it from entering the stream. Um, uh, even though the even though the Egyptians were were, comp, were hatching chickens in, in uh, compost piles 4,000 years ago, uh, Western North Carolina communities were still looking at uh, were still looking at innovative composting in Western North Carolina North, Western North Carolina livestock operations. Um, Washington State University uh, did a project uh, impact of anaerobic digestion on air quality and in community digesters. Again, community digesters keep coming, keep coming up, and there's an awful lot of interest. Penn State University, without carrot or stick, promoting BMPs on small dairy farms. How do you get producers to adopt new BMPs or to adopt new technologies uh, if you don't have a carrot to offer them, some sort of incentive, 
or a stick to beat them over the head with. And, and, that, and that's, sometimes that's a big problem, you know, getting farmers to adopt when they don't have to. There's just an awful, there's a, there's a bunch of these and I don't, I don't want to go through, uh, don't want to go through them, uh, go through them because I, because I think you can look the uh, information up yourself. In summary, through the use of a number of conservation practice technologies, NRCS can help farmers and ranchers handle manure and other waste products in such a way that there's no negative impact on water or air quality. Through the CIG program, NRCS can help bring new technologies to the forefront by providing a means of technology transfer either directly to, to industry or through inclusion of new technology in NRCS's conservation practice standards. For more information about CIG, actually go to the CIG webpage. They've got a good webpage uh, that shows the, shows the projects that have been, uh, that have been uh, uh, funded over the years and, and what, uh, what has come of those. And you can, again, you can get this link if you, if you download the, this presentation from the web. Questions? Glenn, thank you. That's one of the best presentations I've seen to sum up what's been received out of SIG. Um, next step, though, on this. Uh, can you give us an idea how many practice standards of NRCS have actually been changed as a result of conservation innovation grants? Or how many new technologies have been adopted as a result of, of SIG, it, we see the successes, but where's the drill down? Yeah, I agree. I agree, Bruce. That's uh, um, Bruce. Bruce Knight used to be the chief of NRCS. He used to be our big boss, and uh, now he's just one of us that likes to drink beer. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, th that's information that NRCS hasn't done a very good job of of, uh, of isolating or keeping track of. We've got 165, six, seven, eight conservation practice standards that uh, that we deal with and uh, I would I would say that probably the majority of those in some way have been affected by CIGs um, our, our conservation practice standards have to be updated every five years and uh, so we're continually making changes to the conservation practice standards to introduce net new technologies and that's what we're supposed to do is try to bring in technologies from the CIG program 